And if you would, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. This morning, we're continuing the series we've been studying entitled In the Red. And of course, we've defined the phrase in the red as meaning in debt. Experiencing the situation of spending more money than you earned. And I added a little something to that, and that's living paycheck to paycheck. Because if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you are one negative event from being in the red. We've said, of course, that we want to be in the black, meaning we want to be out of debt. We want to earn more money than we spend. We want to live in abundance. And so we began a series to help you to go from being in the red or to in the black. Or if you are in the black, to help you to stay in the black. Because if you're going to get to the place where you are prospering financially like God wants you to, you're going to need a plan. You're going to need God's plan. And so today, uh, we're going to pick up with that. And uh, We actually gave you step one of the plan a couple of weeks ago. We found out that you need to tithe for life. To tithe for life. And then last week, we learned number two, that you need to stop it. Somebody say stop it. In other words, you need to stop all the unhealthy financial behavior that you may have been involved in. We, we mentioned last week that if you want to get physically healthy, you're going to have to stop eating a Twinkie every day. And if you want to get financially healthy, there's some things you're going to have to stop doing as well. In fact, we gave you six things. We said, number one, you need to stop not tithing. Number two, stop not working. Number three, stop not budgeting. Yeah, that one got me one amen. In fact, last week we talked about that it's important for a couple to come together and budget together so that they're on the same page. Otherwise, if one doesn't and the other one doesn't, then that one will just be nagging them. How I many you know nagging don't work in marriage? Number four, not saving. Stop not saving. That's an unhealthy financial practice. And then, of course, we, we learned at number five, or number six, I should say, that you should stop accumulating debt. And number five was to stop spend, make, spending more than you make. I'm sorry, I missed that. Don't want to miss that. Stop spending more than what you make. Thank you for those two amens for that one. And then number six, stop accumulating debt. It's, uh, of course, if you want to get out of debt, the last thing you should do is continue to get in debt. We gave you some very practical things that would help you with that. Today we're going to continue with that, and so go with me if you will. As we said, the Proverbs chapter 2, we're going to read verse 7. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. In fact, read it with me. Ready? Read. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Of course, we said last week, it's no coincidence that you see the phrase the rich, the phrase the poor, the phrase the borrower, and the phrase the lender all in the same scripture. Because for many of the poor, they became poor through becoming the borrower. And God's word reveals to us in this scripture that the borrower is in bondage. That they have signed up to serve somebody else. They've signed up to be a slave to somebody else. So clearly, God is revealing to us that debt is not good. Because if you're in debt, you're in bondage. If you're in debt, you're really working for somebody else. And frankly, if you're in financial debt, you're in a position where you are really limited in a number of areas of life. In fact, I have a video I'd like to show you. So go ahead and draw, draw your attention to the screens.
think about that. What if you had no debt? No payments. None. You didn't owe anybody anything. What could you do? I mean, your retirement would be taken care of, wouldn't it? Your kids would have a college fund, or you'd help do your grandkids' college fund. You'd take care of that, right? You could give like crazy. And you could be such a blessing to people that are hurting. You could be a blessing to your church as they minister to people that are hurting. I mean, if you had no debt, if you had no money problems, how would life be? Yeah, somebody said beautiful. That's right. It'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? And you know, that's the will of God for you. God's will is not for his people to be in debt. In fact, Deuteronomy 28 shows us that being in debt is a result of being under the curse. And we know Jesus came to set us free from the curse. So if we, we know God's will is that we not be in debt, yet we find ourselves today in debt, what do we do? The answer is we have to go to war against debt. We have to declare war on debt. And, 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 of course, when you're talking about declaring war on anything, you realize that when a soldier goes to war, they're going to fight with intensity. They're going to be diligent. They clearly recognize who the enemy is. And they're going to do whatever it takes to win. That's how we got to approach debt. We've got to fight this thing with intensity. We can't waver on whether or not it's my friend or it's my enemy. No, it's my enemy. And we got to be willing to do whatever it takes to get out of debt. Turn to them and tell them, get out of debt. You know, debt is kind of like quicksand. I took my, my kids to, to see a movie a couple of days ago. And in, it was a cartoon movie, and a couple of the characters ended up in quicksand. And you know, when you're in quicksand, you don't just kind of lay there and relax. No, you recognize if I don't do something about my situation, it's going to be over real soon. And, and that's how debt is. Debt is like quicksand. In other words, you hang around in debt long enough, you stay in debt long enough, and it's just a matter of time before it causes some real problems in your life. Amen. I mean, one statistic that was given a while ago but is that 56% of marriages or divorces come as a result of money problems. Yeah. Well, I can tell you right off the top that the vast majority of those money problems came because they were deep in debt. And so if you're in, in the quicksand called debt, you need to get out and get out now. Amen. The problem is we live in a society today that has, you know, really deceived us about debt. Ket said to us, it's a good thing. You know, use it to leverage debt. And, and, and you know, it, it, and, and what's happened is we become like the frog in boiling water. You ever heard that story before? If you were to boil water and then put the frog in it, it'd immediately try to jump out. Take that same frog, put it in the same water, but it's not warm. It's not boiling. It's just room temperature. Put it on the stove and just slowly heat it up. And that frog will be so happy. It'll just be all excited, you know, enjoying itself. You keep heating it up, and it'll just keep on enjoying itself because it doesn't notice the change in temperature. And then at some point, its life ends. And that's where a lot of our society is now. That's where some of us are right now. We've gotten into this thing called debt, and we, hey, we're doing okay. We've been doing fine. You know, we're not like so-and-so, but the water's getting warmer. And it's getting warmer and warmer. At some point, bam, all of a sudden, this thing has had a negative impact on your life. We have to go to war on it. We have to get rid of it. We have to get out of debt. Turn the other and tell them, get out of debt. So go to Proverbs chapter 27. Let's talk about how to do that today. Now, we did say a few things last week that would help us with this. Number one was that you need to budget. You need to do a, a, a monthly budget. Budget every month where you, it, it's a zero-sum budget. It's a spending plan. In other words, it's how we're going to spend our money this month. And then you got to stick with that budget. Because having something on paper doesn't help you any more than not having it on paper if you don't actually do it. So you can't have a budget and then keep overspending and then expect to get out of debt. No, you got to have a budget and stay with it. The number two thing we mentioned last week is that you need to declare, I will never borrow another day in my life. And that's one that some people choke on. They struggle with that one. You know, I can't, how, how, how can I have a car? How can I have a house? How can I? Well, listen, you can get all those things without debt. 
But you can't get out of debt, once again, while you're continuing to go into debt. You got to make a decision. My borrowing days are over. And I can see with some of you, I need to go back and preach that one all over again. But it, it's true. You've got to get to that place where you realize this is not God's best for me. And I want God's best for me. If, it's a, if there's a way for me to get these things that I need in life without debt, that's what I want. And the only way I'm going to have be successful in this war on debt is if I change the way I view it. If I see it for what it is, an enemy, and then I decide I will never, ever be on the enemy's side again. I will never partake of it again. Well, then Proverbs 27, verse 23. Now, let me give you some more things that will help you to get out of debt. Somebody say, get out of debt. It says, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever and doth the crown endure to every generation. Well, we know the subject of this sentence is an understood you. He's telling you what your state of being should be. What should my state of being be? You should be diligent. You know, you should consistently give 100% effort. But diligent to do what? To know the state, the face of your flocks. And you ought to really be diligent and looking well to your herds. Well, once again, you may be thinking, well, I don't have flocks and herds. Well, he, but what he's referring to here isn't necessarily just flocks and herds as much as it is your financial life. In fact, if you look at verse 24 again, he says, for what? Riches are not forever. And so the, and if we were to keep reading, as we did a couple of weeks ago, we found out that these flocks and herds are what cause food to be on their table. It caused clothes to be on their back. It's what they use to pay off debt. I mean, doesn't all those things sound like money? Okay, so without getting reteaching that point, we know that he's telling us here to do what it takes to be financially healthy. But the first point, though, is to know the state of your flocks. To know the state of your financial life. And so... If you're talking about knowing the state of your financial life and you happen to be in debt, then you need to do num the, the number one the point I want to give you today. And that is you need to know what you owe. You need to know what you owe. Which means you're going to have to get out a piece of paper or get on a computer or whatever, whatever you, method you use and list every debt that you have. List the debt, who you, owe, who, who you owe, how much you owe, what the interest rate is, how many years you have to pay it off. And, and, and so because you need to know this, you can't get out of debt if you don't even know what debt you have. And I realize this is a painful exercise for some. It's the very thing we, it's like some people getting on the scale, you know, you don't want to get on the scale. It's the same type of thing, but you got to know where you are before you can get to where you want to get to. Just like if you want to lose weight, you got to get on the scale to know where you are before you can decide, okay, I want to lose 10 pounds or 20 pounds or whatever the case may be. So the first thing you have to do is you have to know what you owe. Take the time to sit down and list every single debt that you have, all of them. Because sometimes we want to act like, well, that's not really, put it all on there. God can get rid of all of it, right? Okay, look, look, next step. Go to John chapter 6. Now, today is probably going to be the most practical message in this series. So I'm, I'm going to tell you up front. We're going to give you the scriptural basis for our approach. And then we're going to mention some practical things to you that you need to pray about. And the Bible says in all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. And so you get before God and let him show you his specific debt cancellation plan for you. John chapter 6, look at the second thing we're going to give you today to help you to get out of debt. Somebody say, get out of debt. Get out of debt. John 6 verse 5 says, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. How many know that God, God knows what he's going to do about your situation? I mean, glad God already knows what he's going to do about your situation. He sees the end from the beginning. Amen. Verse 7. Then Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. 
One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Notice two things about this statement here. The first is that one of the things the enemy would try to get us to do is to look at getting out of debt as a hopeless endeavor. It will never happen. I might as well not even bother to try. What are they? I, I have this amount of money. What is that among so many? And don't fall for that. First of all, you know you serve the God who can do the impossible. And if you don't serve him yet, today's your day to begin to serve him. He's able to do exceedingly above all you can ask or think. And ultimately what you're doing is obeying his word by being a good steward over the money he's given you. And when you prove yourself faithful in being a good steward over the money he's given you, then he'll be able to fully come into the situation and he can wipe out any debt in a heartbeat. I mean, we're talking about the God that caused a nation that was so in, finance, in so much financial trouble, people were eating their children to go from famine to feast in 24 hours. If God can turn around the financial destiny of a nation in 24 hours, God can surely turn around your financial situation and get you out of debt. He just needs you to do your part, to cooperate with him, to obey what he wrote in his word. Second thing I want you to get from this, though, is that God will use what you have. He will use what you have right now. All they had were five loaves and two fishes. I remember a story in 2 Kings chapter 6 where a man had borrowed an axe. They were building a house. The axe fell into the water, and he cried to the man of God, you know, hey, man of God, the axe, it was borrowed. And the man of God found a stick and threw it in the water, and the axe began to float. Well, we know the anointing is ultimately what did the job, but I just, I just, why even bother with the stick? And, and I'm sure God explains some of that to us when we get to heaven, but I just want you to notice that every once in a while, God, God will use little things. He'll use the little you have to create, accomplish big things in your life. That's what happened here. We know the story that, he, that five loaves and two fishes ended up feeding 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So God did something great with that. Then verse 12, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Notice Jesus' way of thinking. He tells his 12 disciples, I want you to gather all the fragments from these 5,000 people's meal. In other words, 5,000 men, not counting women and children, have all gotten some bread and some fish and there's some leftovers. They're, they're sitting in an area that's probably around the size of this sanctuary, maybe even, even bigger. And leftovers are probably all over the place. Yet Jesus says, I want you to gather up all of these fragments. Meaning I want you to make the effort and, and, to, and be diligent in and be detailed in getting every single fragment that's out here. Every single one. I want nothing to be lost. You know, God's not into waste. Sometimes uh, uh, what happens is we, 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 we almost, we get too spiritual. You know, we, 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 we get too, we're lax with our money, we're lax with all kinds of stuff because we expect God to make up the difference. When God's not there to make up the difference, he's there to add his super to your natural. But that means you're not supposed to do the natural. Jesus says, I want you to get every single fragment so nothing remains. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that the lazy man doesn't even roast what he caught in hunting. He catches it and doesn't even bother to, to roast. It's not even really valuable to him. But the diligent man, his substance is precious. Every single part of what he has is precious. And that's important because if you waste not, you'll want not. If you don't waste, you'll find you, you, you'll have more than, 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 than you really thought you could. You'll find many times that God already put into your hands what you need to take care of what problems you have right now. But you've got to have the same attitude that Jesus had, and that is that you're not going to waste what God has given you. Well, notice also that he did tell them to gather up fragments. The word fragment means a piece. So if I, all I have is little pieces in and of themselves, they don't seem to be much. But Jesus was working on something. Look at the next verse here. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 
baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So by the time they end up gathering everything that everyone had left, they got 12 baskets full. Now, we don't know exactly what happened with those 12 baskets. The Bible doesn't tell us. Some people say God gave it to the little boy. Some people say other things. We'll, we'll see when we get to heaven. The point is that when they took the time to gather fragments, they ended up with baskets full. See, your treasures are in your fragments. I'm going to say that again because it's good. I said your treasures are in your fragments. I told this story before, but I, I, I'll mention it again since it fits. When my wife and I first got married, uh, she, I, I found that she kept taking the change from my side of the bed. You know how you go throughout your day, you end up with a quarter here, a dime here. And she kept taking it and putting it in this jar, and I would make fun of her. I said, well, what are you doing? That's not going you know, to be worth much. And then finally she said, we're going to the grocery store. We're going to dump this in a machine that's going to take the change and, and, and give you some money for it. Well, first of all, I didn't even know that type of machine existed. That's why you keep your mouth shut when you're ignorant about stuff. But anyway. <laughs> but second of all, we went to the store. You know, here we are dumping it in. I'm still messing with all oh, this. is not going to be much. You're going to get $5 out of this. When she got done dumping the change, it was $50. Then I said, hey, honey, you know, I could use some of that. She said, uh-uh, no. You've been talking about me all this time. I learned something that day. Your treasures are in your fragments. You'd be surprised how much you actually have if you choose not to waste, and then you do a good job of using the little, little bit that you may already have in your life from, just, you know, from, from very simple things. And that kind of leads to my, my, my point here, and that is that you need to uh, develop a debt snowball. Develop a debt snowball. You may say, what on earth is a debt snowball? Well, I'm going to read this to you, and then, then so I, I get this right, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. When you're talking about a debt snowball, what you do is you list your debts in order from the smallest to the largest. That's so why we talked about what we did earlier. If you're going to know what you owe, well, now take that list and then invert it and put the smallest debt on top. And you just keep on adding, you know, keep on put the next smallest on top, the next small, or you could say the other way around, the largest, I should say, the larger, a larger one behind that, a larger one behind that, a larger one behind that, till you get to your mortgage. Then uh, after you list the debts from smallest to largest, pay the minimum payment to stay current on all the debts except for the smallest one. What are you going to do with the smallest one? You're going to pay it off. Every dollar you can find from anywhere in your budget goes toward the smallest debt until it is paid. Then once the smallest is paid, the payment from that debt plus any extra found money is now added to the next smallest debt. So let's just say your first debt, you were paying $100 a month and you paid it off. Now, let's say your next debt was $200. That's what you were paying. Now you're going to take that 100 you used to pay and add that to the 200 you're already paying. So now you're paying 300 a month on this second debt. Notice what I didn't say. You pay off that $100 a month and then party. <laughs> no, I'm not going to take that money and see it as anything but a part of my snowball. And I'm going to take that 100 and I'm going to put it to the $200 of debt. And then, of course, when you pay off that next smallest debt, then you'll do the same thing with the next debt. And now you'll take that 100 at 200. Now you got $300 to get rid of the debt, and you'll add it to the next one. And you'll keep paying according to that. And the end result is that you got a snowball. I mean, if you were to take a, a, a snowball and just roll it down a hill full of snow, over time it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what will happen with your debt cancellation money. What will happen is you started off with a little fragment. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to get that fragment in a minute. But you start off with that little fragment, and then you start to pay off this debt. And now you're, you're using that extra money to pay off the next debt. You're using the extra money to pay off the next debt. Before you know it, you've got this avalanche of debt cancellation money going, and you're wiping out every single debt in your life. Because you're starting with just the smallest debt. Because you're using a very simple plan. Now, 
someone may say, well, Pastor, that sounds really good, but how do I start with, with, with a debt snowball when I don't have any extra money? Well, go to 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, one of the things that will help you is being a little smarter on how you spend your money. Because now you're looking for a little piece of money to start your debt snowball. And that little piece of money might just come because you don't eat out as much. Or instead of going and renting a movie, you just go to the library and get it, and, and get it for free. Oh, man, it's getting quiet in this place already. You know, you guys are actually doing better than the first service. The first service, I, I thought I was going to have to run out after a few minutes. The looks I was getting. Of course, I haven't gotten to the biggest part yet, though. We'll see how y'all respond. But it might be that there's something, you know, maybe you don't go see that movie when it first comes out. Oh, I mean, there's some things you can probably do that will help you to have that piece of money to get this debt snowball going. Anybody want your debt snowball going? Yeah, you want to start wiping out these debts. And once again, you can see, man, if I just start with a little bit and I wipe out that first credit card debt and I got a little extra money, now I start wiping out that, that, that you know, the debt on that furniture I got, you know, no payments for two years, but now the payments are ridiculous, so now I got to get rid of that. And then I use whatever I got left and I start wiping out that, that car note, and then I start wiping out that school loan, and all of a sudden I got all of this to go wipe out that mortgage. Woo! I mean, I'm rejoicing throughout this entire process. And that's worth maybe cutting back on some things right now. Because <laughs> if I'll just cut back now, then I'll be able to enjoy those things later without having any money problems. Amen. So that's something. But then 2 Kings chapter 4. Some days as a pastor, you just know you're not going to be too popular. <laughs> but when you run around the church, you're talking about, I'm out of debt. Then, then. Be like, yes. Second Kings 4, verse 1. And there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor, the repo man, is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. How many would say this woman is in a bad spot? I mean, her husband has died. That alone is really difficult. Right? She's grieving, I'm sure. But then her husband left her with debt. Good man, but he left her with debt. And her sons are about to be taken as collateral for that debt. They're going to be made slaves. They're going to have no future because of this debt. See, this is one reason why we have to declare war on debt. Because this is the kind of stuff debt does to people. It just causes all kinds of problems in people's lives, impacts their, their health and their family and so many other things. So she does what she knows to do. This is her way of going to God. She goes to the prophet saying, you know your servant feared God. Help me. Notice the prophet's response. I, I want you to notice the prophet does not reach in his pocket and just give her money. Now, there are times God will do things in that way. Don't get me wrong. But we kind of, for some reason... We, even as believers, we, we almost have a hand, handout mentality. Amen. And we only we expect an unexpected income. And, and, and God will prosper you through unexpected income. But many times, he'll ask you what this man is asking her. <laughs> Verse 2. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? Ooh, we might want to underline that phrase. What hast thou in the house? Her response wasn't too different than most people's. Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. <laughs> Save a pot of oil. In other words, what's, what's five loaves and two fishes going to do? Well, I remember a number of years ago in Georgia, we had a, a member come to us. And, and I don't remember if she went to one of our ministers first and then came to me or came straight to me. But the bottom line was she was in financial trouble, not a ridiculous amount. But she was in some financial trouble, had some things that was about to be turned off or something like that. And we asked her this question, what do you have in the house? And after talking with her, we found out that she had a painting on her, whole, her wall that was worth thousands of dollars. So we said to her, well, you just need to sell the painting and, and pay, 
you know, pay your bill. In fact, the painting would have not only paid her bill, it helped her out beyond that. And she got so mad. I don't remember ever seeing her again. I think she left the church. I'm serious. Because I think she really expected us to take money that people had given to the church to pay her bills instead of her taking what was in her house and paying her bill. Now, we laugh about it. But really, some of us might be in that exact same situation. And this is my third point. This will help you to get to that debt snowball. You just might have to sell what you have. Woo! You want to get this debt snowball going? You say, I don't have a piece of money. There might be some things that you need to get rid of. Now, we'll come back to this story, but let me just talk real practical right, for you right now. There might be some things you might have to get rid of. I mean, do you have to have that fourth television that you never watch? You got DVRs on every TV in the house. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Some people, the issue that you might have to sell is that beloved car. Woo! <laughs> Saw some breath come out of some brother like, so he got hit or something. <laughs> now, some of us, our, our cars are such that, you know, we couldn't sell it because we still own it. But you know, some of us, the car is, is a toy when right now it needs to be a tool. And maybe if I just sell that car, I can get that some profit and then take that profit and throw it towards my debt and get this thing going and then later on go get a car cash. I mean, really, when you get to the place where, you know, I don't want to sell my painting, I don't want to sell my car, you're really saying, I'd rather have my stupid painting, I'd rather have my stupid car than be out of debt. Then be able to put, give my kids a college fund. Then be able to be okay for retirement. Then be able to give like God really wants me to be able to give. And when you put it like that, then it sounds kind of silly. What do you have in the house? What is it that you're holding on to that you really shouldn't have right now? And for some of us, that's the issue. We've got things that God didn't tell us to buy in the first place. We got Ishmael's in our houses. We got the son we decided to have, and now that God wants to bring Isaac into your house, we're going to have to get rid of Ishmael. Uh, you're already looking at me funny, so we might as well just go there. Yeah, Pastor, but I want to enjoy life. How much are you enjoying it? Trying to figure out how we're going to pay for basic things next month. How much are you enjoying it when you want to send your kids to private school and you can't? How much are you enjoying it when you know God's called you to do something, but you can't even do what God called you to do because you're afraid that you'll just you'll, you'll fall flat financially because you're so up to here in debt? God says, go to ministry school. You, you can't do it. And so God's first instruction is get out of debt, then go to ministry school. Or you can't start the business God told you to start. You can't pursue the God idea God gave you because you are in debt. Because you want to hold on to whatever. And here's part of the issue. Well, you know, my car or these other things, they're my status symbols. And so you, you're more caught up in what other people think about how you look and what you drive. Then getting yourself out of debt. We talked about the Joneses last week. The Joneses are broke. <laughs> so you need to just leave, leave, leave the Joneses alone. Let them be broke and get yourself out of debt. Then maybe you can go help the Joneses rather than trying to keep up with the Joneses. You just might have to sell what you have to get this thing going. And then be wiser in what you buy going forward. Because we don't always need the newest or latest thing. Now, I mean, I know as a man, you know, I love gadgets like most guys. You know, so they, they got some new technical thing. I don't even really know what it does, but I just want it. <laughs> I figured out when I got it. And with ladies, you know, the latest fashion. 
got to have the latest thing. But do you really have to have it? Is it worth your peace of mind? Is it worth your children's future? Is it worth your marriage? Are you really going to let your lust ruin your life? Are you going to be willing to make the sacrifices now so you can truly enjoy life later? For some, you need to sell what you have. Now, another thing that will help you get started with the debt snowball is that, you know, maybe somebody needs to work some extra hours somewhere. Woo! <laughs> you know, man of God, maybe you need to get, a, you, need, maybe you need to get, you know, be a piece of delivery man on the side. No, pastor, never. <laughs> I got a degree. I got this. I got that. I know, and yet you're still broke. So let's do something about getting broke and then enjoy your degree. Maybe you had to work a few extra hours. And I'm not saying forever. I'm saying for a season. Just so we can get something, so we can get this thing going, we can get ourselves out of debt. Get ourselves out of quicksand. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. See, really, the ability to become debt-free isn't contingent upon a certain income. It's all about changing behavior and being intense about getting rid of that nasty debt. And, and the reason why this debt snowball is so good, and it's a practical thing, as I said, you're going to get before God and pray about it. In fact, go to Proverbs 3, so I'm clear on this. But the reason why it's such a good idea is because what happens is you end up freeing up your most powerful wealth building tool which is your income I mean it's easy to build wealth when you have no payments but you're going to have to sacrifice now to get what you want later if you're willing to sacrifice now then what you'll find is that you can have your life's fortune later Amen. you know the average millionaire drives a two year old used car they live in a middle-class home. They buy their jeans at Walmart. If yeah, I was a millionaire, you wouldn't know they were a millionaire by looking at them. Because they learn how to control themselves. And they learn not to let what other people might think about them. Determine what they, what they wear and what they drive. And I mean, come on, somebody's blinging all over the place. They got some issues. I'm not talking about having a little something that's nice, but you know, you, 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 they, they just got to show all their money. <laughs> fool. <laughs> I mean, that's what they're telling you. I'm a fool. 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 Look at my fool bling. I'm a fool. It's like, you got it now, but you won't have it for long. You got to get past that. And I'm not against a little bling. But you understand my point. You get Proverbs 3. If you'll make the sacrifices now most people aren't willing to make, you'll be able to live like most people aren't able to live. But you got to do it now. I want to say that. You know, here, here's, here's an issue that we got to look at. The country's economy is in a very tenuous state. Everyone agrees with that. I don't care what your political persuasion. Now, you either got a situation where it's going to get better slowly or it's going to get worse slowly I think 99% of people don't agree with that anybody agree with that I mean if, if there ain't no other choices but better and worse well, you don't agree with that I don't know. <laughs> Man. here's the issue if it gets worse you don't want to be in a position where it impacts your house so while things are at least tenuously, you know, okay, you better go after this debt thing so that the next time it goes down, because there's something else they don't tell you and people get all political. It doesn't matter who's in office. The economy always goes up and down, up and down. The economy is cyclical. You can go back through history. There'd be a Republican in office. The economy went down. There'd be a Democrat in office. The economy went down. The economy don't care about who in office. It's going to go up and down, up and down, up and down. So if you don't want to go up and down, up and down, up and down with this credit-driven economy, 
And you don't want to go down the next time it goes down because it'll probably even worse than the last time. Then you need to get on this thing right now. One thing you can't do is, well, you know, I'll take care of this. I'll get, no, no, no. Deal with it now. If you don't deal with it now, then you're going to be sitting, sitting up somewhere five years from now remembering this message saying, boy, I wish I had listened. And hopefully you'll still be married or you still have things that you, that you have right now. You need to get after it. I'm not just saying that. Once again, that's coming out of my spirit. You need to get after it. This is the Holy Ghost warning you. But this is not time. This is not something you put off. This is, this is not. No, 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 no. Now, 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 now. Now, Proverbs 3, 6 says this. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Now, I've given you some practical things, good things, but you ultimately need to go before God yourself. And in every single financial decision you make, you need to find out what God says about it because he has a personalized debt cancellation plan for you. He is your financial counselor. Amen. And whether it's a debt snowball or some other minute, one of the things I didn't talk about is creating an emergency fund. Some say just get $1,000 real quick. Let that be your emergency fund. You don't ever touch it. And then use everything else to pay off debt. Some others say, hey, you know, get three months of your expenses in as an emergency fund and don't touch it and then use the rest. I mean, you got to get before God. But you do need an emergency fund. You know that. That's part of being financially healthy. And, and emergencies is not Christmas gifts. <laughs> or this purse I saw. No, real emergency. You don't touch it. You put it in a situation you can't touch it unless you really need it. But you know, that, 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 these are different kind, of, different kind of strategies and ideas, but you need to get before God because you know you have a responsibility to do what it takes to be financially healthy. Amen. And God is the one who will give you the plan for your life in your situation. Go to Luke chapter 16. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody say, get out of debt. We looked at this the other day. I'm going to look at it again. You know, in this series, I'm, the Lord's got me circling back to the same scriptures over and over and over again. And that's a good thing. Sometimes we don't get it the first time or the second time. And the point is to get it. Luke 16, verse 10. Just remember how God operates. Go, going into my last point here, which will just set us up for next week. He said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in what? Much. Verse 11, if you therefore have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, been talking about money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Talking about the blessing. We talked about this last time. There is a money, there's a management harvest connection. In other words, how much God can bless you is partially determined by how well you manage the money he's already given you. Amen. If you are faithful in managing what he has given you, then he knows that he can give you more and you'll be faithful with that. Amen. If you're faithful in managing the money he's given you, then he can unleash more of the blessing, which make it rich, more of his power in your life to bring more into your life. But if you are unfaithful, then you're tying his hands. And although he wants to do some things in your life, he knows that you couldn't handle it anyway. That's why, you know, you have a preacher that doesn't tie. You got a problem. He's not going to be very anointed because if God can't trust him with the tithe, God can't trust him with the anointing the ministry. But that doesn't just apply to the preacher. It applies to everybody. And so when you finally get to a place where you're doing the things we're talking about, and you, you're, you're being faithful with what God has given you, God can unleash more of the blessing. And now you can get into something I like to call supernatural debt cancellation. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's the, the, the fourth thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you're going to get out of debt, you got to remember that you don't have to do this alone. That God is for you. That he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. But he's a God who can bring unexpected income into your life. He's a God that can give you God ideas. He's a God that can cause promotion to come through your job. He's a God that has no problem getting money to you. He's got a million ways to make you a millionaire. He's a God who is able to, to get you out of debt when you obey his word. 
by being faithful with what he's given you and when you believe for it. That's point number four. You need to believe for supernatural debt cancellation. 2 Corinthians 9 8 tells us very simply here, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. What's that grace? That in this case, this grace is referring to the power to prosper, the blessing of the Lord, the power to get wealth. This is a supernatural power, God's super on your natural. How do you know that that's what this grace is talking about? Because of what it produces. That you always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. And in verse 11 says being made rich. What enriched means. And everything. So you can be generous to all bountifulness. So when this blessing gets on your life and it gets to moving in your life, what it will produce is you being in a position where you always, always, always have all sufficiency and all things. The Bible five Bible says this way, you possess enough to require no aid or support. Well, if I don't need aid or support to get a car, to get a house, to go, go to school or send my kids to school, I don't need debt anymore. I'm in a position where I am debt free. And that's what the grace of God, the blessing of the Lord will do for you. It'll move in your life and God will bring that piece of money here and that piece of money there. And God will open up this door and God will cause it you to have this promotion. And God will do all kinds of things in your life because of his grace, because of his power, and because you put yourself in position for him to do so. You got under the spot where the glory comes out, so here comes the glory. And you've got to believe for supernatural debt cancellation. And that's what we pick up next week. Come on, lift your hands right now. Give God praise and glory. Thank you, Father, for the word of God. Thank you for showing us some practical ways to apply the word of God. And Father, I just pray for every person in here today that you do strengthen them with might. First of all, remind them to implement these things in their lives. To not just hear it, but to do it. And strengthen them with might to do it. Speak to them very specifically about the plan you have for them. The things you want them to sell. The things that you want them to do. So they can be debt free. And Father, I pray you do open the floodgates. Cause the blessing which make it rich to come on their lives in a greater measure as they follow you. Help them to get out of debt, have their needs met, and have a full store to spread the word more. We give you the praise and glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. There's something about God. You start going the direction he wants you to go, and instead of walking, you find yourself walking on one of those escalators. You know, all of a sudden, you're going faster. You're getting there sooner. That's what we want.